politics and social justice. Um, I thought we could kick off our conversation um, and hear from each and each of you about how this has impacted the climate movement and how and the youth climate movement specifically. So why don't we start with Kevin and then we'll turn to Julia and Vassar. Definitely. Um, you know, with the global pandemic and how it has affected the youth climate movement specifically, it's, you know, we were marching, right? We were striking, we were rallying, we were doing protests to demand of our government officials and our world leaders to take climate action. And now we are having to, you know, do all of that via online. And so it's definitely was a huge transition because, you know, every Friday, a lot of students around the world would, um, you know, protest um, every single Friday in person um, and meet in person and get to hang out with fellow climate activists, but that's not the reality now. And so it's definitely been a huge transition in the, or in the sense of organizing. And, um, you know, I think we were, the youth climate movement has been able to adapt because a lot of our organizing was already online, um, you know, having cause, how to do this, how to do that. Um, besides having the in-person meetings, we've been able to change that up as well and uh, really transition online and see what are new tactics that we can use to demand of our world leaders and our government officials to take action on the climate crisis. And so it's been very much seeing that transition really happen really quickly and swiftly right when the global pandemic hit, uh, which has been amazing to see that we are able to, um, you know, have these systems in place already uh, that have been able to really transition us into a new uh, reality, uh, so to speak. And I always say this, you know, the youth climate movement uh, and youth in general are the leaders of today, not tomorrow. And, you know, we're the change makers of today. We're the advocates of today. We are the world leaders of today. Um, and so that in itself has been so, you know, so inspiring to see how young people have been able to adapt during this global pandemic. Thank you. Kevin. Um, Julia, do you want to join us on that? Sure. Um, I think a lot of organizations um, have had to pivot. The whole world has had to pivot. I know we were going to do our grounded summit um, and then we got um, the news that COVID was just around the corner. And so we were actually one of the first events to cancel just to be super proactive about not getting um, especially climate warriors, the solution is sick. Um, so we had to pivot our entire strategy, but I think it really shows um, how interconnected we all are and how fragile our systems are in place and that we weren't really, even though science was warning us on the pandemic front um, that, that a, a global pandem pandemic was coming, we really as a society weren't prepared to completely um, change. And, and I think that's the same with the climate crisis. Um, scientists have been warning us for years and it's getting to a point where we're so reactive as a species. And um, I think in order to really address the climate crisis, we need to take proactive steps, not reactive. Um, so I think it just for me and, and many other people I've talk, talked to highlighted our fragility um, but also our res resiliency. So we are really resilient, but we need to take those proactive steps in order to turn this crisis around. Just building on that really quickly before we turn to Vassar, or Vassar, you could answer this too, but do you think that there's a, a sliver of opportunity in a moment that's been so disruptive for climate specifically? So yeah, I, I absolutely think, uh, not to just jump in, Julia, but I think that what has happened in this COVID-19 uh, world is that we have been disrupted. And COVID-19, to be honest, it's it's been something that's been super tragic and it's been very hard, but it's also a sign of what's more to come if we don't seize this moment to build back better as a society uh, and a society that listens to science and prioritizes people and the planet. And that's what I think the climate movement and especially the youth movement has embraced in this time. I think we've embraced these occurrences as a reality because that's what it is. It's not 
a meme where it's saying, you know, let's just get to 2021 and everything uh, will be better. But these things aren't happening by chance. This is climate change and it is human induced. So we've, we've embraced this new reality in a way as, but as a challenge to do better and to take this moment um, of, of time to really build back better. And especially in terms um, and in light of all the other issues that are happening around the world like Black Lives Matter. And it's been really great to, to be honest for, uh, and necessary for the environmental movement to recognize that intersectional environmentalism has to be part of the defini definition of sustainability moving forward and that the environmental community uh, has to do better um, and when approaching solutions. And we also have recognized that the power of the digital world um, in global activism, we have the tools at our fingertips to take on global issues and really who understands new media better than the youth. So we've been able to really evolve activism into uh, on uh, the internet of things and through social media and through uh, technology and the tools that we have at our fingertips. Such a good point, Ambassador, thank you. Um, Moving to Kevin again, um, in your capacity as a climate activist, um, how can and how are today's youth driving true climate action? And how are you specifically in your organizations and your efforts driving change? Mm -hmm. Definitely, I guess in a broad sense, I think young people have you know, shown out. They literally are doing everything from systematic action, you know, lobbying our politicians, lobbying world leaders, uh, attending these uh, huge conferences like you at the UN um, and um, numerous summits and you know discussions about the solutions around climate and so definitely young people are so involved in so many aspects of the climate crisis and how they've been fighting and advocating on be behalf of the people on the planet um, but also doing their individual steps. I think one of the things that I tend to focus on is both individual actions and systematic actions because we both we need them both. Uh, mm -hmm. They're so crucial to make sure that we're not only doing systematic action where we're demanding of our world leaders to take action, but we ourselves are taking the action so that we can bring that ex you know bring that um, to that you know um, example to them saying like, hey, we're taking you know we're walking the walk. Why aren't you talking you know why? You're just talking the talk, you're not walking the walk, right? We're doing both at the same time. Um, but as for, you know, my, you know, individual and organizational uh, actions that we've been taking, we definitely, you know, as you mentioned in my introduction, being uh, someone who uh, helped, you know, pass the Youth Climate Commission actually being the first ever in the world and first ever in the nation, I really saw that young people around the our nation and around the world don't really have a say in politics and uh, don't have a seat at the table. And I really wanted to make sure that young people do have a seat at the table and that they have the power to really make a difference in their community. So the Youth Climate Commission gives it gives that to them. And so, you know, One Up Action, the organization that I founded and I'm the executive director of, um, is doing just that. You know, we are really we transitioned a lot to focus on how we can support marginalized young people, support BIPOC leaders in the sense of resources and making sure that they too can start a youth climate commission. They too can start other actions and do uh, amazing climate solutions. So definitely there's, we have three programs that are, uh, one of them is still having to be launched, but we still have, we have two programs. We just launched our action chapters. Uh, we're in 32 countries. Uh, within those 32 countries, we have over uh, 65 chapters, and then we have our Youth Climate Commission program, which we're working with C40 to get Youth Climate Commissions up and running. And those are some of the actions that, you know, One Up Action is taking and I'm taking to make sure that young people around the world have a say in government, but also can do what they need to do, right, in the sense of individual action and uh, systematic action. And Kevin, you're doing all of that digitally now with you know, not many different chapters of your organization around the world. 
Yes. So all of it's been, yeah, we've been able to grow. um, We've been growing exponentially, you know, uh, all online. So everything is now on all, you know, everything is all online and we communicate with all of our leaders uh, worldwide, you know, through our technology. And it's been interesting to see these, you know, other different activists from around the world talk about their experiences and what's going on in their countries and talk about what climate action looks like and how we can support with resources. And um, it's just been quite amazing to see, you know, the world and all the different activists in different communities trying to come together in one body and trying to make, you know, um, change happen. I wanted to ask this before in a prior question, but um, I'm curious, have, do you feel like the momentum around youth really committing to and being actively involved in driving climate action, is that is that continuing to grow despite everything that, you know, all the change and um, disruptive, yeah. disruption of 2020? Does the momentum around youth prioritizing climate and really rallying around it um, continue to grow? Definitely. I guess that question is, you know, quite hard for me to answer because we don't know, right? I think young people are always, um, in, you know, it, climate change is endowed within our, you know, spirits and within our activism, right? And a lot of us really um, are fighting and advocating, um, you know, for climate justice. And so it's definitely been interesting to see that more leader, more new leaders are emerging even during the global pandemic. So I, I don't think the momentum has stopped. I think it's just growing. Um, and I think also like, you know, with the momentum growing, I think it's also interesting to see how, you know, uh, with everything that's happening with the social justice issues and um, uh, Black Lives Matter and all of these other different issues that are emerging because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we just, we notice our, you know, much of our leaders and um, our activists are recognizing that we must include all these uh, issues. And I think uh, Vassar put it greatly, intersection environmentalism, uh, which was, you know, uh, founded by um, multiple people, but uh, Leah Thomas was the one that coined the term. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw was uh, the one that created the term intersectionality. Um, but intersection environmentalism is the basic, you know, um, need to fight for the people and the planet. And remembering that is so important. And so just seeing all of this happen during the global pandemic and seeing how much people can be mobilized through online is just so interesting to see. And um, it's also interesting to see the how people post that they're, you know, planting a tree or doing uh, other types of actions where they're joining city council meetings and stuff like that. So it's definitely, I don't think the momentum is gone. It's just growing from here. Yeah, and as you mentioned, just the importance of all these issues coming together and people seeing how, mm -hmm. how connected the health of the planet is to social justice and you know actually building a vibrant future that works for all people, not just you know a select few. Um, Definitely, that's a powerful shift. Um, Vassar, um, you know, I wanted to direct this qu next question to you. One of the biggest hurdles to rallying around climate change is an overwhelming sense of fatigue and anxiety. Um, can you talk about how we can help build a positive groundswell of support that not only receives buy-in from today's youth, but also permeates older generations? Um, and it'd be great to hear examples through your work with the Oxygen Project specifically. Absolutely. So I love this question because it hits on so many different points. So I know I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to try to get to them all and give you some great examples. But when we're talking about climate change, we are up against time and power. And so if we really want to solve for the climate crisis, we have to activate people across generations, but also across skill sets, professions, demographics, and borders. Uh, globally. And this is a challenge that my team at the Oxygen Project and I have accepted. We really have embraced new media and its many tools and analytics as a mechanism for new age global activism. And with an issue like deep sea bed mining, which is largely under the radar and has been unfortunately heavily greenwashed by pro mining interests, my team and I at the Austin Project needed to communicate the complexity and urgency of this issue in a way that would resonate with and activate a diverse audience across generations. 
and how we can and how we did that uh, successfully, we have reached millions of people all over the world and our video, our launch video has gone viral. Uh, but we did that by pulling in celebrity and using scientific, the scientific community and scientific voices as well to raise up youth activism and youth, youth activist voices uh, as well in our campaign launch video. So I know I don't have a ton of time to talk about the deep sea bed mining issue, which is near and dear to my heart. I'm the deep sea bed mining campaign director at the Oxygen Project, but you can just take it from Dr. Sylvia Earle and Philippe Cousteau, who sum it, really sum it up really well in our campaign launch video, saying deep sea bed mining is like clear cutting the ocean and scientists warn the effects will be catastrophic and irreversible. And so if you haven't already seen it, please go to our social media and to our website to watch the video and to learn what to do to take action on this issue. Um, also at the Oxygen Project, we are a millennial and Gen Z run organization. We are, have been a global online digital platform and digitally run organization before COVID-19. So we were set up really well when COVID-19 happened. Um, nothing really changed for us. We just got a lot busier. But uh, we can take risks and we can also pioneer new models uh, for activism on all forms of new media. And that is something that we have really tried to stay true to, um, especially during the COVID-19 times to get innovative and to not really have boundaries um, for the activism. So on October 1st, we'll be rolling out uh, a new part of our deep sea bed mining campaign. We have collaborated with Effortless Audio to release an album. It's a lo-fi album. So all of the songs are created uh, by artists to uh, really evoke feelings of the ocean and what the producer of the album said is that if there's one way to reach people, it's at the core of their goodness. And if we can reach a lot of pe good people and activate them through music, then we've not only reached our goal for ocean conservation and impact, but we've also proven that a music impact collaboration model can work. So we're really using all forms of new media to try and uh, change the narrative and, and really drive uh, global impact and especially around deep sea bed mining um, and just try to prove new models uh, of ways to be able to raise awareness and to get the impact that we want to see. Um, also, one point that uh, Justin, you made so eloquently with that question is about anxiety and eco anxiety is something that I think is definitely increasing, um, especially amongst the youth, but it's not exactly always a bad thing. It can actually be something if turned into motivation can be a superpower. And I think the reason why so many people are feeling eco anxiety and climate anxiety is because your body really just wants to take action. So if you can harness, uh, if you can harness your understanding for climate change um, and really your deep concern around the science and spark that into action, then that's not only a way to overcome your eco anxiety, but it's also really the way that we're gonna solve the climate crisis because not one person can do it, but it's gonna take a collective action and it's gonna take a, a cross cutting collective action from all of us. So, Really, I, I guess I would just want to wrap up uh, with saying that I know that our climate goals are lofty and it's an uphill battle, but they're achievable. And kind of paying ode to that first question that Justin asked us, um, COVID-19 in 2020 has definitely taught us that massive rapid global response to climate change and these related issues are possible, but we really need political, private, and public will to help expedite some of these transformative policies 
investments and solutions. Thanks, Pastor. Um, an important point, I think, too, about the work that you're doing, um, and I know we all care about, is also the deep understanding that we have the climate solutions at hand right now, and one of those central solutions is protecting and restoring our lands and our seas. Um, and without those remaining intact, um, the remaining ones that are, are intact, intact, um, we can't solve climate change, and we certainly wouldn't be able to have a vibrant, healthy planet to live on. Um, so that's a, you know, I'm just grateful that you're doing that work. Um, I've got a question for Julia. I can't believe how quickly time is flying by. Um, but for Julia, um, you know, despite this endless barrage of evidence that the planet is in crisis, um, it's really tough to stay hopeful and even sometimes to know what to do. So I'd love for you to speak on, um, you know, what are some of the actions that people can take right now and what gives you hope that we can solve the climate crisis? Sure, I will be mindful of time. Um, <laughs> well, I actually lost my home to the last Kincaid fire in October. And I have to be honest, sometimes I do have climate anxiety and despair, but the antidote to my, um, I guess you could say climate anxiety back in 2017 was launching my own um, climate solutions organization with the aim to de-silo um, the environmental movement um, and be an amplification platform to getting all the most relevant solutionists out there, including all of you on the panel, um, to the world so that the world has more hope that we can turn this around. So I'm um, I'm optimistic that we can because like I learned from you, Justin, less than 3% of all philanthropic dollars go to the environment. And I feel like we're not even trying, this is us not even trying to reverse the most existential crisis um, that we're facing in um, this moment and for many years to come. Um, so immediate things people can do right now, I'm not going to go over like solar and um, recycling and the cliche solutions. I want to give people very action oriented solutions that aren't really talked about. Um, so I'll be brief with those. Um, number one, vote. We must vote for leaders that um, support the science and recognize what we're up against. And we'll do everything, not just to recognize that we're in a crisis, but actually implement solutions to turn this around, not just with a renewable green economy, which is what a lot of politicians talk about, but also drawing down atmospheric carbon and preserving and protecting biodiversity. So number one, vote for the people that care about science. Um, number two, um, um, what you wear. A lot of people don't realize that the fashion industry contributes to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So just be mindful. Do you need to buy more clothes? Probably not. But if, if you want to purchase um, clothing, make sure that it's conscious and that they're, um, they're good for the environment or they have that ethos in mind. Um, I'd also say um, another solution that people probably aren't aware of is who you bank with. Um, there are a few banks that have divested or out, um, Amalgamated Bank actually is the only bank that's fully divested, but Bank of the West has a very strong divestment plan. All the other banks um, are really, um, <laughs> slacking off their, they are extracting in the Arctic and on um, the Amazon. And so when you bank with one of those banks, you're actually contributing to the climate crisis because those dollars go towards deforestation and mining and um, all the bad things. So make sure who you bank with is more conscious about the climate crisis. Um, so thank you to Amalgamated Bank and Bank of the West for really leading the way on banking the right way. Um, and the final one I'll leave people with is uh, make sure that you um, you reduce your food waste. If you aren't going to eat it, don't take it. Um, food waste, if it were its own country, would be the third largest contributor of global greenhouse gas emissions. If it were the country of food waste, it would be massive. So we all collectively today can stop wasting morsels of food on our plate. <laughs> so those are individual actions. And then of what gives me hope, I'd say everyone on this panel um, and then all the solutionists out there. Um, there's so many boots on the ground organizations. I know Namante Nemkimo with Amazon Frontlines, who you introduced me to, Justin, who's preserving the Amazon. And then there's a, a bunch of amazing individuals as well. Um, and I'm mindful of time and I wanna list some off I was going to, but um, I wanted to um, just say that we're launching the Climate Academy with BBC next week. Um, so for the first time ever, we will show you um, a teaser, a 30 second teaser to finish off. And 
these are, this teaser is featuring two of my favorite ocean warriors, um, other than Vassar, um, Christina Mittermeier with Sea Legacy and Only One, um, and then um, Lahua Kamalu, she's um, with the Polynesian Voyaging Society, um, and she really represents indigenous wisdom. And I, I think indigenous communities give me a lot of hope because if we, um, if we really operate with reciprocity and love of, of the world, like a lot of indigenous communities do, and preserve these vital carbon sinks and empower these indigenous communities to do just that, I think we'll be in a way better position to reverse this crisis. So with that, I'll show a little 30 second teaser. My first voyage was really inspired by understanding this earth around us. What we say is malama honua, to care for the earth. Indigenous people are the last people on this planet that are still connected to the operating system of planet earth, and that knowledge is being lost. What a mistake we make if we don't learn from what they know to save ourselves and save the planet. Amazing, thanks, Julia. Um, and you know that I completely agree with you on those points. Um, I know we're at time, so I do wanna give everybody a quick chance to um, you know, just list URLs that you wanna direct people to if, if they're moved to, to kind of join you in your climate action. Ours, the organization I represent is oneearth.org and we have great social media channels you can follow us on as well. Um, Julia, what URL do you wanna call people to? The climate, oh, you know what, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, of course, grounded.org for the Climate Academy, but I do want to say Ecoside Law um, is a great one for uh, making sure that the earth has a lawyer and mandating that Ecoside become the fifth crime against humanity. Great. Vassar? I'm muted as well. I just put <laughs> it in the Zoom chat, but uh, visit us at theoxygenproject.com. We have the most updated information on deep seabed mining. We have Manga Bay writers writing about it all the time. So you can find everything there. You can also find us on socials. Um, please follow us on Instagram. You'll see our release of our effortless uh, audio project for Deep Blue and all updated information across there and other social media platforms as well. Wonderful, thanks, Faster. Kevin? Definitely. You can follow me at I'm Kevin J. Patel. So you can follow my story of what I'm doing with activism and all the different climate actions I'm taking with my group. Um, but you can also follow One Up Action and you can find us at oneupaction.org. Great. I know we are over time. So I want to thank everybody for staying with us, hopefully. Um, and just a quick shout out that, you know, we know we have the climate solutions right now. We know what to do. They're essentially you know, shifting to 100% renewable energy, protecting and restoring our lands and our oceans. We need 50% intact. Um, and then the last piece is really shifting our agriculture systems to regenerative carbon negative agriculture. And what that means in practice is that we need to support the millions of people around the world that are leading the way on the ground to make that transformation happen to achieve a vibrant, healthy planet where we solve climate change and actually build a vibrant future for all people. So um, join us, don't give up. Um, thanks everybody. Have a great climate week. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.